The Magician's Nephew by C.S. Lewis, Chapter 2, Diggory and His Uncle. It was so sudden and so horribly unlike anything that had happened to Diggory, even in a nightmare, that he let out a scream. Instantly, Uncle Andrew's hand went over his mouth. None of that, he hissed in Diggory's ear. If you start making a noise, your mother will hear it. And do you know what a fright might do to her? As Diggory said afterward, the horrible meanness of getting a chap in that way almost made him sick. But, of course, he didn't scream again. That's better, said Uncle Andrew. Perhaps you couldn't help it. It is a shock when you first see someone vanish. Oh, why, it even gave me a turn when the guinea pig did the other night. Was that when you yelled? asked Diggory. Oh, you heard that, did you? I hope you haven't been spying on me. No, no, I haven't. But what happened to Polly? Congratulate me, my dear boy. My experiment has succeeded. The little girl's gone, vanished right out of the world. What have you done to her? I've sent her to, well, another place. What do you mean, asked Diggory. Uncle Andrew sat down and said, well, I'll, I'll tell you all about it. Have you ever heard of old Mrs. LeFay? Wasn't she a great aunt or something? Well, not exactly. She was my godmother. That's her there on the wall. Diggory looked and saw a faded photograph. It showed the face of an old woman in a bonnet. And he could now remember that he had once seen a photo of the same face in an old drawer at home in the country. He had asked his mother who it was, and mother had not seemed to want to talk about the subject much. It was not at all a nice face, Diggory thought, though, of course, with those early photographs, one could never really tell. Wasn't there, wasn't there something wrong about her, Uncle Andrew? Well, <laughs> depends on what you call wrong. People are so narrow-minded. She certainly got very queer in later life and did unwise things. That's why they shut her up. Oh, in an asylum, do you mean? Oh, no, 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 nothing of that sort. Only in prison. I say, what had she done? asked Diggory. Ah, uh, the poor woman. She had been very unwise. There were a good many different things, and we needn't go into all that. She was always very kind to me. But look here, what's that got to do with Polly? I do wish you'd... All in good time, my boy, said Uncle Andrew. They let old lady Mrs. LeFay out before she died, and I was one of the very few people whom she would allow to see her in her last illness. She had got to dislike ordinary, ignorant people, you understand. I do myself. <laughs> but she and I were interested in the same sort of things. It was only a few days before her death that she told me to go to an old bureau in her house and open a secret drawer and bring her a little box that I would find there. The moment I picked up that box, I could tell by the pricking in my fingers that I held some great secret in my hands. She gave it to me and made me promise that as soon as she was dead, I would burn it, unopened with certain ceremonies. That promise I did not keep. Well, then, that's jolly rotten of you, said Diggory. Rotten? <laughs> oh, I see. You mean that little boys ought to keep their promises. Mm -hmm. Very true. Most right and proper, I'm sure. And I'm very glad you've been taught to do that. But, of course, you must understand that rules of that sort, however excellent they may be for little boys and servants and women and even people in general, can't possibly be expected to apply to profound students <laughs> and great thinkers and sages. No, Diggory. Men like me who possess hidden wisdom are freed from common rules just as we are cut off from the common pleasures. Ours, my boy, is a high and lonely destiny. And he said this and he sighed and he looked so grave and noble and mysterious that for a second Diggory really thought he was saying something rather fine. Then he remembered the ugly look he had seen on Uncle's face the moment before Polly had vanished. All at once, he saw through Uncle Andrew's grand words. All it means, he said to himself, is that he thinks he can do anything, anytime, with whatever he wants. Of course, said Uncle Andrew, I didn't dare to open the box for a long time, for I knew it might contain some, something highly dangerous. For my godmother was a very remarkable woman. The truth is, she was one of the last mortals in this country who had fairy blood in her. She said there had been two others in her time. One was a duchess and the other a charwoman. In fact, Diggory, 
You are now talking to the last man, possibly, who really had a fairy godmother. There, that'll be something for you to remember when you're an old man yourself. I bet she was a bad fairy, thought Diggory, and added out loud, but, but what about Polly? How you do harp on that, said Uncle Andrew. And as if it mattered, my first task was, of course, to study the box itself. It was very ancient, and I knew enough to know that it wasn't Greek or Old Egyptian or Babylonian or Hittite or Chinese. It was older than any of those nations. Ah, oh, that was a great day when I at last found the truth. The box was Atlantean. It came from the lost island of Atlantis. That meant it was centuries older than any of the Stone Age things they dig up in Europe. And it wasn't a rough, crude thing like them either, for it was very the very dawn of time. Atlantis was already a great city of palaces and temples and learned men. He paused for a moment, as if he expected Diggory to say something, but Diggory was disliking his uncle every minute, so he said nothing. Meanwhile, continued Uncle Andrew, I was learning a good deal in other ways. It wouldn't be proper to explain it to a child. About magic in general. That meant when that I came to have a fair idea what sort of things might be in the box. By various tests, I narrowed down the possibilities. I had to get to know some, well, devilish, devilish queer people and go through some very disagreeable experiences. That's what turned my hair gray. <laughs> One doesn't become a magician for nothing. My health broke down in the end, but I got better, and at last, I actually knew. Although there was not the least chance of anyone overhearing them, he leaned forward and almost whispered as he said, The Atlantean box contained something that had been brought from another world when our world was only just beginning. What? said Diggory. Only dust. Fine, dry dust. Nothing much to look at. Nothing much to show for a lifetime of toil, you might say. Ha! But when I looked at that dust, I took jolly good care not to touch it, and thought that every grain had once been in another world. I don't mean another plant, you know. They're part of our world, and you could get to them if you went far enough. But a really other world, another nature, another universe, somewhere you would never reach, even if you traveled through space of this universe forever and ever, a world that could be reached only by magic. Well, and here Uncle Andrew rubbed his hands till his knuckles cracked like fireworks. I knew that if only you could get into the right form, that dust would draw you back to the place it had come from. My early experiments were all failures. I tried them on a guinea pig. Some of them died. Some of them exploded like bombs. That's a jolly cruel thing for you to do, said Diggory. How you do keep keeping off the point, said Uncle Andrew. That's what the little creatures are for. I bought them myself. Let me see, where was I? Oh, yes. At last I succeeded in making the rings, the yellow rings. But now a new difficulty arose. I was pretty sure now that a yellow ring would send any creature that touched it into the other place. But what would be the good of that if I couldn't get them back to tell me what they had found there? And what about them? A nice mess they'd be if they couldn't get back, said Diggory. You will keep on looking at everything from the wrong kind of view, said Uncle Andrew. Can't you understand that this thing is a great experiment? The whole point of sending anyone into the other place is that I want to find out what it's like. Well, why didn't you go yourself then? Diggory had hardly ever seen anyone look so surprised and offended as his uncle did at this simple question. Me? Me? The boy must be mad a man at my time of life in my state of health to risk the shock and the dangers of being flung suddenly into a different universe. I've never heard anything so preposterous in my life. Do you realize what you're saying? Think about an what another world means. You might meet anything, anything. And I suppose you sent Polly into it, said Diggory. His cheeks were flaming with anger now. And all I can say, he added, is even if you are my uncle, is that you behaved like a coward sending a girl to a place you're afraid to go yourself. Silence, sir, said Uncle Andrew, bringing his hand down on the table. I will not be talked like that to like that by a dirty little schoolboy. You don't understand. I'm a great scholar, the magician, the adept, 
who is doing the experiment. Of course I need subjects to do it on. Bless my soul. You'll be telling me next that I ought to, ought to have asked the guinea pigs permission before I used them. No, no great wisdom can re be reached without sacrifice. But the idea of my going myself was ridiculous. It's like asking a general to fight as a common soldier. Suppose I'd gotten killed. What would become of my life's work? Oh, do stop jawing, said Diggory. Are you going to bring Polly back or what? I was going to tell you when you so rudely interrupted me that I did at last find out a way of doing the return journey. The green rings draw you back. But Polly hasn't got a green ring. No, said Uncle Andrew with a cruel smile. And then she can't get back. And it's exactly the same as if you'd murdered her. Oh, she can get back if someone else will go after her wearing a yellow ring himself and taking two green rings, one to bring himself back and the other to bring her back. And now, of course, Diggory saw the trap in which he was caught and he stared at Uncle Andrew saying nothing with his mouth wide open. His cheeks had gone very pale. I hope, said Andrew, Uncle Andrew in a very light and high and mighty voice, just as if he were the perfect uncle who had given a handsome tip and some good advice. I hope, Diggory, that you are not giving to showing the white feather. I should be rather sorry to think that anyone in our family had not enough honor and chivalry to go to the aid of a uh, lady in distress. Oh, shut up, said Diggory. If you had any honor and all that, you'd be going yourself. But I know you won't. All right, I see I've got to. You are a beast. I suppose you planned the whole thing so that she'd go without knowing it and then I'd have to go after her. Of course, said Uncle Andrew with his hateful smile. Very well, I'll go, but there's one thing I jolly well mean to say first. I didn't believe in magic until today and I see now it's real. Well, if it is, I suppose all the old fairy tales are more or less true. And you're simply a wicked, cruel ma magician like the ones in the stories. Well, I've never read a story in which people of that sort weren't paid out in the end. And I bet you will be. And it serves you right. Of all the things Diggory had said, this was the first that really went home. Uncle Andrew started and then there came a look over his face with such horror that beast though he was, you could almost feel sorry for him. A second later, he smoothed it all away and said with a rather forced laugh, Well, well, I suppose that's a natural thing for a child to think. Brought up among women, as you have been. Oh, wives' tales. <laughs> I don't think you need to worry about my danger, Diggory. Wouldn't it be better to worry about the danger of your little friend? She's been gone some time. If there are any dangers over there, well, it would be a pity to arrive a moment too late. A lot you care, but I'm sick of this job. What do I have to do? We well, really must learn to control your temper, my boy. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll grow up to be just like your Aunt Letty. Now attend to me. He got up, put on a pair of gloves, and walked over to the tray that contained the rings. They only work, he said, if they actually are touching your skin. Wearing gloves, I can pick them up like this, and nothing happens. If you carried one in your pocket, nothing would happen. But, of course, you'd have to be careful not to put your hand in the pocket or touch it by accident. The moment you touch the yellow ring, you vanish out of this world. And when you're in the other world, I expect, of course, this has not been tested yet, but I expect that the moment you touch a green ring, you vanish out of that world, and I expect to <laughs> reappear here. Now, I take these two green and drop them in your right-hand pocket. Remember very carefully which pocket the green ones are in. G for green, R for right. G, R. You see? Which are the first two letters of green? One for you and one for the little girl. And now you pick up a yellow one for yourself. I should put it on your finger if I were you. There'd be less chance of dropping it. Diggory almost picked up the yellow ring when he suddenly checked himself. Look here. What about mother? Supposing she asks where I am. The sooner you go, the sooner you'll be back. But you don't really know whether I can get back. Uncle Andrew shrugged his shoulders, walked across to the door, unlocked it, threw it open, and said, Oh, very well, then. Just as you please, go down and have your dinner. 
leave the little girl to be eaten by, eaten by wild animals or drowned or starved in the other world or a loss there for good. If that's what you prefer, that's all one to me. Perhaps um, before tea time, you better drop in on Mrs. Plummer and explain that she'll never see her daughter again because you are afraid to put on the ring. By gum, said Diggory. Don't I just wish I was big enough to punch you in the head? Then he buttoned up his coat, took a deep breath, and picked up the ring. And he thought then, as he had always thought afterwards, too, that he could not have decently done anything else. <laughs> Thank you.